Hey gang, we're back again. Um, this time we have a new author that we're reading, uh, C.L. Moore. We do have a book associated with this one, but unfortunately the book is out of print. So um, there should be two PDFs available through you through D2L that should, you should be able to read to read this um, to read this uh, read this particular, these particular stories. And unfortunately, again, it is kind of hard to read on the PDFs. Uh, I apologize about that, but these are the the copies we could really get available to you as opposed to you guys trying to hunt down more expensive versions of the original book that we used, we've used before in the past. Um, who was Seal Moore? Uh, Catherine Lucille Mo uh, Moore was a woman. Uh, she was part of the Lovecraft circle. She joined quite late, um, unlike other members of the, of the circle. Uh, she joined because of this very story that we're, we're reading today, Black God's Kiss. This was a cover story. This is one of the stories that made the cover of Weird Tales, which was unusual because most of the time, uh, Lovecraft stories usually didn't make the covers of Weird Tales, odd, oddly enough. Uh, Call of Cthulhu did not make the cover. Uh, uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth did not make the cover. These stories did not make the cover of Weird Tales. But C.L. Moore did, and it was a huge success. In fact, before um, H, uh, uh, Lovecraft even talked to uh, C.L. Moore or started correspondence with her, uh, he would talk to other members of the Lovecraft circle about how much he enjoyed the, the story Black God's Kiss. And there were other members of the Lovecraft circle, such as Robert Block, who were more negative. They're saying, oh, this is just a simple romance story. And what he means by romance is a sword and sorcery type story. There's no deeper meaning to it. But Lovecraft disagreed. He, he, he liked to call Catherine, Catherine the Great. He thought she had some brilliant ideas, some brilliant imagery, this this dreamlike quality to her stories he thought was truly unique. And he, they eventually did serve sort of a correspondence to each other. Um, she was aghast at the fact that this, this, this person who had been writing for years thought her work was so good. And in fact, um, he actually introduced her to another part of the Lovecraft circle, and she actually ended, ended up marrying that man. Uh, that man actually eventually, it was another a member of the Lovecraft circle who was a writer, and he did eventually end up marrying uh, C.L. Moore. And they did end up writing together for, uh, for a number of years as well. Um, the first story we're starting with is Black God's Kiss. It is not C.L. Moore's first story, but again, it was it was the one that was kind of her breakthrough story, the one that got her really noticed by people as, as far as things go. Uh, do you want to take over here then, Peter, and talk well, about the story? Well, we're going to treat Black God's Kiss and Black God's Shadow as two parts of the same story. But we're we're going to do that for purposes of this video. We don't want to belabor things. Uh, Black God's Kiss, in many ways, is a very straightforward revenge story. Okay, Gerald, this dynamic fighter, okay, feels belittled and, uh, and, and uh, feels deeply diminished, okay, by Guillaume's arrogance and by the kiss that he steals from her, that she, that she, makes a pact with herself that she is going to go to another world. She knows how to get there. There's a tunnel that will take her there. And in that other world, that world ruled by death, she will steal a kiss of death and come back and have her revenge on Guillaume and consign his soul to hell. Very straightforward story in many ways with some philosophical aspects to it because the descent through that tunnel is a descent into a world whose rules are different from our own we've talked about this many times the love crafty and weird is about a world whose rules do not follow common sense in a sense the love crafty and other okay is an other way of experiencing reality and in this other world she travels to she has to discard put aside for a moment the cross the chain and cross that she had been wearing around her necks there is something about this other world and the way it works which is evil it imprisons souls it's a kind it's a kind of it's a kind of dantean hell this is a place where those who were once alive are tormented for their sins. And 
the God who presides over this world, for lack of a better term, we call him the dark God or the black God. But his idol, his idol, okay, if she can kiss it, she's convinced she can take that power back to the surface world, to our world, which is, by the way, medieval France, okay, and have her revenge. Okay, At one point in this world, and excuse me for moving very quickly, and I hope it's not, a, I'm not, I hope I'm not spoiling anything, but she encounters a version of herself, a mocking, disdainful, derisive version of herself who seems to understand Gerald way too well, but encourages her in her journey and her quest for revenge. And we're reminded of Arthur Macon's white people in this sense. Um, in many senses, Jarrell is the Green Book girl. She um, she is descending into, into this world of, I'm going to say, Arcadian world. Arcadia oh. was was it was a was a was an area of Greece, and it's it's using English language to say a dreamlike, uh, Romo Grecan type world because we get these these images. And you you mentioned Dante. I'm also remember uh, re reminded of um some of the scenes of people being tortured in 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 Tartarus in in Greek myth and things of that nature. But we have this world that's of great beauty and yet there's something wrong with it. Everything's twisted and wrong and broken to some extent in this world. Everyone's being tormented. Even these great these, these creatures of great beauty are being tormented in this world. I, I'm and, so glad that you said Arcadia and reminded us that what we're talking about in this other world is not dungeons. It's not Dantean in that sense. This world of afterlife, this world of apparent eternity has an awful beauty to it. It's a it's a world with a starry sky, but we don't recognize those constellations. They're different. But it's a it is a, a world that is beautiful in both stories. Okay, she travels on a journey through an alluring and beautiful place. Okay. But it is a place of despair and torment, a place of awful beauty. And in the end, we as again, we have the twist again. One of the things we get in these Lovecraftian stories is, of course, the, the twist. And the twist in this case is that uh, there's one point where uh, she's talking to the mirror version of herself. And she says, what do you want to do? I want to kill. I want to kill Guillaume. Oh, do you? Why do you want to kill him? Because I hate him. Oh, really? You hate him? Is that so? OK. And you're, you're giving the hints that there's something else going on there. And in the end, we find out that what that um, Jarell has mixed up her passions. The reason that she feels so strongly against Guillaume is a mixture of both hate and love. She both hates him with all her being, and she also admires and loves him with all her being. And she does not realize that until he is gone at the end of the story. If really we stopped at the end of Black God's Kiss with that horrible epiphany where she realizes she is killed and consigned to hell no less the man she loves whom she is she loves more than any other it's as if we had the abrupt ending of the white people of making the white people it's as if the green book girl as ambrose argues as ambrose argues in the epilogue of the white people ambrose says the green book girl did not realize it but she was destroying herself she didn't realize how these powers she had awakened in the force and in herself she didn't realize how they were poisoning her and the green book the green book as a record a diary of a journey ends abruptly and it's incomplete and ambrose closes off that world by destroying the roman idol Okay, so in a sense, Black God's Kiss ends where Macon's story about the Green Book Girl ends. But we are in what I might call full empowerment. And there, therein uh, is the importance of Black God's shadow. She returns to that world this time, this time to rescue Guillaume. And the only way she can do that 
is through empowerment. She must somehow find it in herself to do more than she did in her previous journey to get the black god's kiss. In this journey, she must prevail. She must somehow challenge and overcome the authority of the black god. She has three victories. Okay, now I'm engaging in interpretation as I try to understand those three victories. You may understand them differently from the way I do as I struggle with what is going on in this very sophisticated, multi-layered story, Black God's Shadow, where she realizes, in a sense, her own godhood. In, in these three victories, the nullness, the coldness, the void of the dark god competes with her memories of struggle in this life, her memories of flesh and blood existence with her feelings. The dark God and Gerald and her feelings vie with each other. As a result of her second victory over the Black God, she realizes she could destroy the Black God that she could dispense with the black god and what it represents completely. But she realizes, and this it sets us up for the final victory, she realizes that both are needed, both worlds are needed, both life and death are needed. Both the fullness of what it means to be a contradictory human being, and certainly Gerald is that, and the nullness, the void, the coldness of the black god, both are necessary. So that in sh she wants to struggle with the black god, but struggle in such a way that she allows it to live to give her the opportunity to experience her authority, her power. And in so doing, she displaces the dark god's authority over the dark god's world, and she sets free all the spirits who are, in, who are in torment. But she does not dispense with the dark god. It will remain the dark god's world, but in that world, she has complete latitude to set free those she will set free, and among them is Gio. And from this, we see an overarching narrative with the weird. If we look at early stories of the weird, such as Archimacan's white, white people, what is that about? It's about the fact that there is this, this other world, that every, again, there is an existential horror. Everything we may, that we think is true may not be true. And what are, what are they afraid of at that time? They're afraid of a little girl having power. Keep in mind, this is, this is this is the patriarchy. This is the British patriarchy. This is the white, the whitest of the whitest Anglos Anglo-Saxon of the most white Anglo-Saxon, most Protestant wasp people ever. We're and, speaking of author Macon. We're talking about the story of the white people. This is a story that inspired H.P. Lovecraft and his sense of the weird. In Macon's story, we're in, at the end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, and the British Commonwealth is still the British Empire, and the sun never sets on the British Empire. White patriarchy has never been more powerful, more preeminent, and more dominant than at this time. Okay, and so the Green Book Girl represents a threat to that, and it's momentarily contained. But as of Lovecraft, correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, as of Lovecraft, there is no containing the cosmic other. It fills up the universe. Okay. There, there is no, there is no resource or refuge or hiding in our own ignorance anymore. We're doomed to know, and the cosmic otherness, the deep ones, the old ones, the outer ones, <laughs> represent who we really are. We have an empowerment motif. And again, uh, Macon is very much talking about, you know, good old traditional values. And by the time Lovecraft is writing, those traditional values have begun to change in the 20th century. It's becoming a modern world with all of its modern sensibilities. Science is showing that the universe is far older, far more complex, far, 
far larger than 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 anything we can comprehend. The very much so, humanity and Earth are no longer at the center of the universe. They're shown to be off in some far corner of the universe and almost insignificantly small. So by the time we get to Lovecraft, we get stories like like the Call of Cthulhu. We get stories like the Shadow of Innsmouth. We're not only we or he basically where he's giving up this cry that there, there there is this outer world there is this greater world but he can't be naked he can't sit there and say oh wow we need to be vigilant we really lucked out with that green girl to prevent you know this this thing from happening because in the end we are a member of the marsh family we are from in's mouth we we do see the dreams of cthulhu at night we are part of the problem we thought we were the thing that we were uh, we were part of the part of the wall of protection that was keeping these 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 outsiders out. But Lovecraft reveals to us, no, you are the outsider. You are the monster that you 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 thought you were protecting the world from. And now we've gotten to see all more. And what is see all more saying? She's saying she looked at what Macon said. She looked at what what Lovecraft says, and she said, "Yeah, but this gives individuals so much power. This gives especially." women especially minorities people who have been kept out of power this puts power out of the out of takes the power out of the hands of large organizations of large traditional societies and puts that power into the power of the individual it doesn't matter who your parents were in, in, in the world that that cl moore is growing up in what matters is what you can do what what that your personal experiences your loves your passions what you have done in your life that is what beats back this darkness. C.L. Moore is describing a universe which is in chaos. This traditional way of doing things is, is in chaos now. And it's, it, it is a void. It's dark. It's insignificant. No, it's not. You can fill that void with your own purpose, with your own individual value systems. Would you be talking about nihilistic optimism? <laughs> I, I'm talking about things that you see in films such as every, every, everything everywhere all at once we're basically saying that the fact that everything could be possible doesn't mean that nothing has any meaning it means that what you choose to do is incredibly important is what it says you have the choice of doing anything what you choose to do then is very important not the idea that well it doesn't matter what i do because everything's possible again what it's saying is that our choices, our beliefs, our, our own inner spark, as C.L. Moore would say it, is what truly matters in the darkness of the void. And I think we'll leave it there, guys. And next, we're going to jump into the new weird. We're going to take a jump of almost um, probably about 80 years into the future and see what happens. All right. Bye.